Back to the phone lines, Alicia. She's listening in St. Louis, Missouri. Hi. Hi. I think I enjoy your show. I look forward to listening to it when I'm in car riding, and I appreciate what you're doing. I have a probably a one question that parlays into another, um, probably that was prompted even by my today being a day. It's my birthday. Mm, happy but, birthday. Uh, thank you very much. And I mentioned that, hey, because... I um, have committed to taking part in a, a long fast with a, a, a congregation that I've been a part of. And what prompted my question was, of course, I was thinking, oh, it's my birthday. I want to treat myself and what have you. But I thought about uh, something that was kind of interesting to me. Are we responsible for mortifying the deeds of the flesh? And, and, and like, you know, is, is that up to us? you know, in terms of our fasting, and because what it makes me think about is the difference between works and faith. And then I guess the, the next question that this kind of parlays into is... Let me, let me say that um, real quickly before you parlay. Let me say that this is not about a question between whether you're saved by what you do or by what Jesus Christ has done for okay. you. This is okay. something that a believer does. A believer okay. exercises abstinence in various fashions so that they might experience union with God. It is a way, okay. so to speak, of feasting on God. So when you withdraw from certain pleasures, it is so that you might have the ultimate pleasure of union with God. So so okay. often our stomach becomes our God, and what we're doing in essence is saying to God, Lord Jesus Christ, I place everything on the altar so that I might experience you in all your fullness, in all your beauty, and in all your graces. Okay. So I guess, well, thank you for, for clarifying that. So then... I guess that has nothing to do with that. Is that the same as mortifying the deeds of the flesh? Well, in a sense, yes, this is what you are doing. I mean, what okay. you're doing is you're crucifying the flesh, put another way, living the crucified life. And in some okay. sense, you can relate this first and foremost to your baptism. Baptism is a burial. And the one that comes out of the water is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Another way of putting that, and there are various metaphors that communicate this union with God, is the idea of engrafting. Now you have engrafted in your life the life of Christ. And what we want to do is use all the means at our disposal so that we do not feed the mortal flesh, but we feed the union with God or the engrafting of the life of Christ. And so God offers us all kinds of ways in which we do that. We do that through prayer. We do that through fasting. We do that through meditating upon the Word of God. We do that through taking spiritual inventory of our lives. The unexamined life is not worth living. We do that by partaking in the Eucharist. So there are ways in which we feed the life of Christ within us as opposed to feeding the carnal flesh. Okay. Okay. And um, I, I just I wanted to make certain that I wasn't doing anything in excess seemingly where, you know, we're taught certain things or shown certain things in church. And I just wanted to make sure that it is certainly within, you know, it's biblical, and because this is a long one, you know, this is for the month. And then the next thing that... Well, kind of, wait, when you say it's a long one for the month, is it an abstinence of all food, or is it just fasting from certain foods? Right. It's uh, just, that's the, you know, eating vegetables and fruits and sure. yeah. water and, and, yeah. and that. So, yeah. um, And then the other thing that kind of, I think, is a little related is... I hear um, pastors touch on this, but I never. It seems to always go over my head, and that is with rewards. Is there, in fact, uh, I haven't done any studying about it really on my own. Is there, in fact, um, you know, there that will be greater in in heaven and in the kingdom, you know, versus others, you know, based upon what's done here. 
Yeah, there's no question about that whatsoever. Okay. Jesus said himself, store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. So we can store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And of course, the way in which Paul describes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is that you cannot lay a foundation other than the one that is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. But you can build on that foundation, either using gold, silver, and costly stones, or inferior materials like wood, hay, and straw. And your work is going to be shown for what it is. It's going to be revealed with fire. And if what you build survives, you will receive, according to Paul, reward. If it is burned up, you will suffer loss. And then says Paul, you yourself are going to be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So there's a lot in scripture that points us to the fact that we can store for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and where thieves do not break in and steal. I wrote a whole chapter on this in my book, Resurrection. It's titled Rewards. Also wrote on this in my book, Afterlife. Be right back with more answers. 